Welcome back to the world of Eichert, where we learn how to think like the college board. Today we're covering topics 9.6, 9.7, and 9.8. Here's the required content for 9.6, globalized culture after 1900. Political and social changes of the 20th century led to changes in the arts, and in the second half of the century, popular and consumer culture became more global. Arts, entertainment, and popular culture increasingly reflected the influence of a globalized society. Have you guys ever seen a Star Wars or Marvel movie? Movie, or any other Hollywood film. Yeah. And did you know that they're popular around the world? Yeah. Have you ever seen a Bollywood movie? I'm a huge fan of Amir Khan's films like Three Idiots and Lagan. And did you know that Bollywood has a wide international audience outside of India? Now I do. Have you ever listened to music from anywhere? My favorite music is K-pop. How about other forms of entertainment? I have a rather large collection of vintage obscure manga. Pokemon! And did you know that you can eat McDonald's in over 120 countries in the world? And you can go to a KFC in over 140 countries in the world. God bless America. How about sports? Ever heard of the World Cup? The Olympics? The NBA? I've heard of them. These sports franchises are now popular all over the world because we live in a globalized culture. The last part is about how consumer culture became globalized and transcended national borders. Did you know that people like to buy global brands like Nike and Apple? And did you know that you can buy them online on platforms like Amazon and that people around the world can do the same thing? I know all of those things. Then that's enough of 9.6. Here's the required content for 9.6. 9.7 Resistance to Globalization After 1900 Responses to rising cultural and economic globalization took a variety of forms. Let's take a look at anti-IMF and anti-World Bank activism. First, let's talk about what the IMF and World Bank are. Both arose in 1944 as a result of the Bretton Woods Summit, where Western representatives devised a system to stabilize the international financial system and rebuild the economies shattered by World War II. Although the Bretton Woods system only lasted a couple of decades, there were a few lasting legacies, such as the dominance of the U.S. dollar in world trade and the existence of the IMF and the World Bank. The World Bank is an international financial institution that provides loans and grants to the governments of poorer countries for the purpose of pursuing capital projects. It aims to reduce poverty by providing financial and technical assistance to developing countries for development programs, such as bridges, roads, schools, etc., that can improve economic prospects and quality of life. The IMF is an organization of 190 countries working to foster global monetary cooperation, secure financial stability, facilitate international trade, promote high employment and sustainable economic growth, and reduce poverty around the world. The IMF provides advice to its member countries, aiming to stabilize their economies, helps them to manage or prevent crises, and provides financial support to countries struggling with balance of payments problems. But the advice and financial support from both the World Bank and IMF come with many strings attached. They often will tell the governments of countries requesting assistance how they should manage their economies and financial sectors. For example, criticisms focus on their policies and impacts on developing countries, particularly in relation to structural adjustment programs, which have been widely perceived as having detrimental effects on the poorer segments of societies in these countries. There were protests in Argentina, Bolivia, and Greece against the IMF's prescribed austerity measures, telling their governments to cut social spending on things like healthcare, welfare, and pensions. There was also activism against the World Bank's funding of certain projects that had been criticized for environmental and social effects. For example, the Narmada Dam project in India was designed to help India's economy and provide electricity, but also included serious environmental consequences and displaced many poor people, so people protested against that. These forms of activism challenged the economic liberalization policies promoted by the IMF and the World Bank, which include liberalization of markets, privatization of public enterprises, and reduction of government intervention in the economy. Activists argue that these policies benefit multinational corporations and wealthy nations at the expense of local autonomy and economic justice. Many activists not only protest against policies of the IMF and the World Bank, but also promote alternative economic models that emphasize sustainability and local governance. This includes support for fair trade, local agriculture, cooperative business models, and ecological sustainability. This connects to movements like the World Fair Trade Organization and Greenpeace that we discussed in 9.5. Perhaps we're already living in Unit 10, deglobalization. How's about we just finish up Unit 9 and call it a day? 
excellent idea. Here's 9.8, Institutions in a Developing World. New international organizations, including the United Nations, formed with the stated goal of maintaining world peace and facilitating international cooperation. Let's talk about the United Nations. The United Nations was established in 1945 to help countries work together to prevent wars and solve global problems. The UN helps countries talk out their problems, create common rules in areas like health and trade, and work together on big issues that affect everyone, such as climate change and human rights. By offering a place for these activities, the UN encourages nations to solve problems together rather than on their own. Through the UN, countries engage in multilateralism, a way of working where multiple countries cooperate on issues. This approach is crucial because many of today's challenges, like global warming and pandemics, need everyone to work together and find solutions. The UN also promotes peace and security by sending peacekeepers to areas of conflict and helping to resolve disputes. Furthermore, it holds countries accountable for their actions by making their policies and behaviors more visible on the international stage. This helps ensure that countries follow global rules and contribute positively to world peace and development. Despite its ambitious goals, the UN has not been able to completely prevent conflicts or ensure peace worldwide. Various political and economic interests among its member states can lead to deadlock, especially in the Security Council, where five permanent members, the US, the UK, France, Russia, and China, have veto power that can block the UN's decisions. However, the UN has made notable successes. It has managed numerous successful peacekeeping missions, helped reduce child mortality, and improve health through its agencies like the World Health Organization, and facilitated international agreements on climate change, such as the Paris Agreement. The European Union, the EU, is another major example of international cooperation aimed at promoting peace and stability among its member countries. Originally formed to prevent the kind of devastating conflicts that occurred during the world wars in Europe, the EU has grown to focus on economic integration, political cooperation, and social harmony among its members. Its achievements include the establishment of a single market, allowing goods, services, and people to move freely. The creation of the euro, a common currency used by 19 of its member countries, and significant strides in environmental protection. While challenges such as economic disparities among members and political disagreements over policies like migration persist, the EU has largely succeeded in maintaining peace and stability across Europe. Well, that's it, guys. No more topics. And no more units. Are we really done, Mr. Eichert? History is over. And we all lived happily ever after, thinking like the College Board.